Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. Last time we talked about polyandry. Today we are talking about its counterpart, polygyny. But before we can do that, as I so often do, I have a few questions for you. The first one is, who does monogamy benefit and how? The second one is, who does polyandry benefit? And again, how? The third one, you can probably guess, who does polygyny benefit and how? Because I don't think that the answers to these questions are straightforward. I think most people who've been raised with a Western human rights perspective, who've been exposed to that perspective, who've been told that that is the good modern perspective, would say that polygyny is bad because it exploits women and monogamy is good because it doesn't. But nobody ever says how this works. And I think, you know, none of these questions ever talk about polyandry, really, um, as if it doesn't exist. And it is a minority practice, but it does exist. And I don't know what ideas you might have had about polyandry before the last lecture, but, you know, I think it, it's very tempting to think that polyandry is this, like, matriarchal paradise or something where women get to have their own harems of men. And actually, no, it doesn't work like that. It's actually still pretty patriarchal. Um, it's clear that polyandry benefits men probably more than women. Um, it doesn't benefit men equally, right? It privileges older brothers as opposed to younger brothers. So, and we can explain how that happens by actually looking at how the marriages get negotiated, um, when and how marriages fail, and so on. And I want us to be able to ask these same kinds of questions about monogamy and polygyny. So, Let's talk about polygyny in more detail than we have before. Specifically, polygyny is marriages consisting of one man and multiple women who are married to him. This is a binary gendered concept pretty much, so I'm going to be talking in binary gendered terms again for this lecture. Unlike polyandry, there is no need for the wives to be related to each other. There are some situations in which polygyny can be covert. Polyandry is always open and overt, not secret. And the level of status and social recognition of the different wives can also vary. In polyandry, in theory, all of the husbands are equal, although it doesn't actually work out that way. But with polygyny, there are much more explicit differences in the statuses of different kinds of wives. However, you might also be wondering, what's the difference between polygyny and infidelity? Is cheating a kind of polygyny, or for that matter, is cheating a kind of polyandry? Um, and where, where are the lines? And I want to say, first of all, that they do get fuzzy. But we still want to analyze a lot of the various situations that we um, collapse under the name of polygyny as polygyny and not as simply infidelity because of the character of the secondary relationships, even if they're secret they are sustained, they are marriage-like, and there is often at least some kind of social acknowledgement of the second spouse, um, third spouse, whatever, and also acknowledgement for the children. But especially in the Tajik case, Thibault does note that this is blurry because in Tajikistan, men don't need their wives' permission to begin additional relationships or to contract additional marriages. 
if you are married to somebody, he can just bring home another wife one day. And that is not something that you necessarily have any power over as a first wife. And another related question. I, I have lots of questions for you this time. What even is infidelity or cheating? What constitutes infidelity or cheating? Please answer in the comments. All right, so let's look at the specifics of how this actually plays out in Tajikistan. So marriage is a matter of wealth, transactions, and social status. This is very classically anthropological, very Levi-Strauss. And then as you might expect, marriages are generally arranged by the families, especially in rural areas. Okay, again, makes sense. And I really don't want you guys to think of arranged marriages as something that is necessarily an oppressive practice. I hope we've looked at enough different situations this semester to see how people's emotions and people's pragmatic interests can work together. And in order to see that marriage doesn't always have to be the emotional center of your life. And maybe if you don't love your spouse, that's actually okay. Um, maybe that's just not what your marriage is about. But I do think it's important to note that parents' choices aren't 100% binding. The kids can say no. However, Tajikistan doesn't have a dating culture. Dating is a culturally specific activity that exists in some places in the world, has been exported to other places in the world, has not been exported to yet other places in the world. So in the absence of a dating culture, how might you meet someone else that you like? This is, this is the thing about the fact that the parents' choices aren't binding, but who else is it going to be? Divorce in Tajikistan is on the rise, in part because of changing social opinions. Divorce has just been rising worldwide, um, but specifically in part because of men's labor migration to Russia. Polygyny is illegal. However, a number of different actors in society want to see it legalized on the grounds of protecting women, preserving Tajik culture, and preventing other social ills, which we will talk about on the next slide. So polygynous marriages, when they happen, are only solemnized or celebrated religiously and socially. There's, there's no legal bit. And moreover, celibacy or remaining unmarried is undesirable. Again, this is super classic Levi-Strauss, because if you are unmarried, you have no one who's committed to providing for you. And that is bad and scary. So there are a number of social incentives and arguments in favor of polygynous marriages. One is an Islamic belief that there are more women than men, as reported by Thibault. I don't know if this is accurate or not. I'm just going with what she writes. This is not factually true. We've talked about this before in terms of sex assigned at birth. Generally, there are equal-ish 50-50 ratios, um, minus the intersex population. So it's not factually true, but it does currently have some truth in Tajikistan because of labor migration, which has taken men away from rural Tajikistan. So the men exist, but they're not there to actually marry. So it's kind of like they don't exist. It is believed by many people to prevent various social ills. Some of these claims seem plausible to me. Others I'm a little more skeptical about. Um, believed to prevent infidelity and prostitution, STDs, divorce, and to prevent slow population growth. Um, in terms of the idea that it reduces promiscuity because if men need sexual variety, they can just 
get a second or a third wife and have multiple committed relationships instead of sleeping around, okay, I can see that argument for preventing divorce, um, reducing the incidence of sexually transmitted diseases, and reducing the incidence of infidelity and the market for sex work. For slow population growth, that's the one I'm really skeptical of. Um, the thing is that women can only have so many children in a year or two years. They're, the body can only do so much. And so it doesn't matter if, you know, a woman is monogamously married or polygynously married. She can't have more children. But you probably weren't expecting the opportunity to subvert the patriarchy that is built into second and third marriages. So if your marriage has ended because your spouse has divorced you or because you've been widowed, you get to choose if you ever want to get married again. And your family doesn't get a say in it the second time. You get to choose your own spouse, both for women and for men. Your parents might not even like your choice, so it can be a good way to rebel. And while first wives with high status and kind of strict ideas about how they should behave, lots of family obligations are kind of obliged to be housewives, second wives don't have to care about that. They can work. They can be outside the home. They can be a little more scandalous. They can have hobbies and careers and fulfill their heart's desires. Now, this is not to say that things are totally egalitarian, because they're not. Men's discussions of why they wanted multiple wives, according to Thibault, was centered around sexual desires needs. Men just need a lot of sex, so they need a lot of women. And Thibault tells us it is perceived as a patriarchal institution because polygyny allows men to have multiple wives and denies women the same opportunity to have multiple partners. But lots of women actually want to become second wives. So what are we to make of their active choices and desires? And this is where I want to talk about who monogamy benefits. Because if polygyny is not actually available to women as a choice that they can make, if they can only make monogamous marriages, they might actually make more disadvantageous marriages for themselves than they would have if they could have freely chosen to be a second wife. So again, Thibault says being a second wife is desirable because you can actively renegotiate patriarchal rules. Polygyny offers men a chance to choose a partner for themselves. They too are restricted by parental authority and it's fun for them to throw that off. But men do still have more freedom to act on their sexual desire and the idea that women have sexual desires that must be satisfied, that society must accommodate, that's not, no, that, that doesn't happen. So I want to leave you with some final questions about how you tie this to the situation around yourself in Kazakhstan from what you've seen. This is our culture is often used to support polygyny in Kazakhstan, at least in terms of ethnic Kazakh culture, right? It's not really part of Russian culture. Who becomes a Tokal and why is this a status some women might prefer? Kazakhstan, unlike Tajikistan, does have a dating culture. And while parental approval is important for who you marry, parental choice doesn't seem to be the deciding factor in marriages in cities, but it, you know, in the rural areas, things are, of course, different. In other words, there are potentially other ways to subvert patriarchal values and expectations in Kazakhstan that don't necessarily depend on becoming a Tokal. But what do you think? Thank you so much for your time. 
and your attention. And I'll catch you next time.